Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start out with some jury charge. Ready? Here we go. For you to convict the defendant of this crime, the state must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, that the defendant acting alone or with one or more persons committed or attempted to commit the crime of kidnapping. Two, that the defendant or another participant in the crime of kidnapping caused the death of Jennifer Hawk Pettit. Three, that the defendant or another participant caused the death of Jennifer Hawk Pettit while in the course of and in furtherance of the commission or attempted commission of the crime of kidnapping or in immediate flight from the crime and for that Jennifer Hawk Pettit was not a participant in the kidnapping. The first element of felony murder that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the defendant acting alone or with one or more persons committed or attempted to commit the crime of kidnapping. As I explained to you a moment ago, under our law, a person commits kidnapping when he abducts another person. I have already charged you both on the meaning of the term abducts and on the specific intent required for kidnapping in my charge on the sixth count, and I need not repeat that instruction. The second element of felony murder that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the actions of the defendant or another participant in the crime of kidnapping caused the death of Jennifer Hawk Pettit. You must find that Jennifer Hawk Pettit died as a result of the defendant's or another participant's actions. Remember with respect to the 10th count and later the 14th count, count, the state specifically claims that the defendant and not another participant caused the death of Jennifer Hawk Pettit. The third element of felony murder that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the defendant or another participant caused the death of Jennifer Hawk Pettit while in the course of and in furtherance of the commission of the crime of kidnapping or in immediate flight from the crime. This means that the death occurred during the commission of the crime of kidnapping and in the course of carrying out its objective in the course of the commission of the crime of kidnapping means during any part of the defendant's participation in the crime of kidnapping. The phrase in the course of the commission is a time limitation and means conduct conduct occurring immediately before the commission, during the commission, or in the immediate flight after the commission of the crime of kidnapping. The immediate murder of a person to eliminate a witness to the crime or to avoid detection is also in the course of the commission. Thus, the death of Jennifer Hawk Pettit must have occurred somewhere within the time span of the occurrence of the facts which constitute the kidnapping. In furtherance of the crime of kidnapping means that the killing must in some way be causally connected to or as a result of the crime of kidnapping or the flight from the crime of kidnapping. The actions of the defendant that caused the death of Jennifer Hawk Pettit must be done to aid the crime of kidnapping in some way or to further the purpose of the crime of kidnapping. It does not matter if the act that caused the death was committed unintentionally or accidentally, rather than with the intent intention to cause death. The defendant is as guilty when committing this form of murder as he would be if he had intentionally committed the act that caused the death. The fourth element of felony murder that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that Jennifer Hawk Pettit was not a participant in the crime of kidnapping. A participant is one who takes part in or shares in the underlying crime. If you find that the state has proven each of the elements of the crime of felony murder beyond a reasonable doubt, out, you must find the defendant guilty of felony murder. If you find that the state has failed to prove one or more elements, beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find him not guilty. The 11th count accuses Stephen Hayes of capital felony and charges that at the town of Cheshire on or about the 23rd day of July 2007 between 3 a.m. and 10 a.m. at 300 Sorghum Mill Drive that said Stephen Hayes with the intent to cause the death of a person who he kidnapped did cause her death during the course of the kidnapping in violation of section 53A54B5 of the Connecticut General Statutes, I have already charged you on the elements of the crime of capital felony by murder during the course of a kidnapping in my instruction on the 10th count, and I need not repeat that discussion. You must, of course, keep in mind that the alleged victim in the 11th count is Haley Pettit. With respect to the 11th count, proof of the element of murder will depend on your verdict as to the second count. The state must additionally prove beyond a reasonable doubt 
that the defendant had kidnapped Haley Pettit and that the murder of Haley Pettit occurred during the course of the kidnapping. Finally, the two witness rule, which I have discussed in my instruction on the fourth count, applies to the eleventh count, the rule of lesser included offenses, which I explained in my charge on the second count, applies to the eleventh count as well, if and only if you unanimously acquit the defendant of capital felony as alleged in the eleventh count, you must consider the lesser included offense of felony murder. I have already instructed you on the elements of felony murder in my charge on the tenth count, and I need not repeat that instruction. You must, of course, keep in mind that the alleged victim in the eleventh count is Haley Pettit. The twelfth count accuses Stephen Hayes of capital felony and charges that at the town of Cheshire on or about the 23rd day of July 2007 between 3 and 10 a.m. at 300 Sorghum Mill Drive, the said Stephen Hayes with the intent to cause the death of a person who he kidnapped did cause her death during the course of the kidnapping in violation of section 53A-54B5 of the Connecticut General Statutes. I have already charged you on the elements of the crime of capital felony by murder during the course of the kidnapping in my instruction on the 10th count, and I need not repeat that discussion. You must, of course, keep in mind that the alleged victim in the 12th count is Michaela Pettit. With respect to the 12th count, proof of the element of murder will depend on your verdict as to the third count. The state must additionally prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant had kidnapped Michaela Pettit and that the murder of Michaela Pettit occurred during the course of the kidnapping. Remember that with respect to Michaela Pettit only, our kidnapping law contains a special rule applicable to charges involving alleged victims under the age of 16. With respect to alleged victims under the age of 16 years, the term without consent means but is not limited to deception and any means whatever, including acquiescence of the victim if the parent or other person having lawful control or custody of her has not acquiesced in the movement or confinement. Finally, the two witness rule, which I have discussed in my instruction on the fourth count applies to the twelfth count. The rule of lesser included offenses, which I explained in my charge on the second count, applies to the twelfth count as well, if and only if you unanimously acquit the defendant of capital felony. As alleged in the twelfth count, you must consider the lesser included offense of felony murder. I have already instructed you on the elements of felony murder in my charge on the tenth count, and I need not repeat that instruction. You must, of course, keep in mind that the alleged victim in the 12th count is Michaela Pettit. The 13th count accuses Stephen Hayes of sexual assault in the first degree and charges that at the town of Cheshire on or about the 23rd day of July 2007 between 3 a.m. and 10 a.m. at 300 Sorghum Mill Drive, the said Stephen Hayes compelled another person to engage in sexual intercourse by the use of force and by the threat of use of force in violation of Section 53A-70A1 of the Connecticut General Statutes. Section 53A-70A1 of the Connecticut General Statutes provides that a person is guilty of sexual assault in the first degree when such person compels another person to engage in sexual intercourse by the use of force against such other person or by the threat of force against such other person which reasonably causes such person to fear physical injury to such person. For you to convict the defendant of this crime, the state must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, that the defendant compelled Jennifer Hawk Pettit to engage in sexual intercourse and two, that the sexual intercourse was accompanied by the use of force against Ms. Hawk Pettit or the threat of the use of force against Ms. Hawk Pettit, which reasonably caused her to fear physical injury to herself. The first element that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the defendant compelled Jennifer Hawk Pettit to engage in sexual intercourse. Sexual intercourse means intercourse between persons regardless of sex. Its meaning is limited to persons not married to each other. Penetration, however slight, is sufficient to complete intercourse and does not require emission of semen. Compelled has its ordinary meaning. 
It means that the alleged victim did not consent and that the defendant must have required the alleged victim to engage in sexual intercourse against her will. If you find that the alleged victim consented to the act of sexual intercourse, you cannot find that the act was compelled. Such consent must have been actual and not simply acquiescence brought about by force, fear, or shock. The act must have been truly voluntary. Consent may be expressed, or you may find that it is implied from the circumstances that you find existed. Whether there was consent is a question of fact for you to determine. The defendant has no burden to prove consent. The state must prove compulsion. The second element that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the sexual intercourse was accomplished by the use of force against Ms. Hawk Pettit or the threat of the use of force against her which reasonably caused her to feel fear physical injury to herself. It is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant was armed with or used any weapon for you to find that the defendant used force. Use of force means that the defendant must have used actual physical force or superior physical force to compel the alleged victim to submit to sexual intercourse. You may find a threat of the use of force because you find that a threat was actually expressed or you may find a threat implied from the circumstances and from what you find to have been the defendant's conduct. Any such threat must have been such that it reasonably caused the alleged victim to fear physical injury to herself. Physical injury means impairment of physical condition or pain. Whether the fear of physical injury was reasonable is a question of fact for you to determine from the circumstances that you find existed at the time. The state need not prove that the sexual intercourse was compelled both by the use of force and the threat of the use of force. You must unanimously find that the sexual intercourse was compelled either by the use of force or by the threat of the use of force, as I have defined those terms for you. If you find that the state has proven each of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty as charged. If you find that the state has failed to prove one or more elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find him not guilty. The 14th count accuses Stephen Hayes of capital felony and charges that at the town of Cheshire on or about the 23rd day of July 2007, between 3 a.m. and 10 a.m., at 300 Sorghum Mill Drive, the said Stephen Hayes with the intent to cause, with the intent to cause the death of a person, did cause her death in the course of the commission of sexual assault in the first degree in violation of Section 53A-54B6 of the Connecticut General Statutes. All right, we will is some literary material now. Get back to this jury charge. Let's see what we have here. This is one we had started called Honey, I'm Buying a Home. Ready? Here we go. I had always known that each city has its own personality, but as I toured homes, I started to get an idea of what it might be like to live in those cities. Everyone knows Huntington Beach for its beautiful sunny beaches, but who knew it had so many amazing Italian restaurants? I always thought of Fullerton as a college town famous for its nightlife, but it also has some great antique shops. I was having fun pretending I was on HGTV using terms like backsplash and original floors when I looked at homes until one day when I met up with my friend Liz who had purchased her first home a year earlier. As a home buyer, you want to live in a place for at least five years for the investment to make sense, she said, between bites of pancakes. We were at brunch, flipping through pictures of my potential homes. Try to imagine what you'll be doing there 
then and what you'll want. In five years I'd be 30, but that seemed so far away. At this point, my only plan plans were to finish graduate school and eat that leftover pizza in the fridge. I left brunch feeling dejected. How could I shop for a home? I'd like five years from now when I didn't know what I'd want then. When my real estate agent initially suggested I get a place next to a park, just in case, I shook my head. A child was the last thing on my mind. I needed to focus on things that were important to me now, like school, my career, and re-watching Gilmore Girls. And yet I knew everything would change in five years. My boyfriend and I had been together for a while and were toying with the idea of getting married. What if in the next few years we decided to have a baby? Just because I didn't want kids now didn't mean future me wouldn't want them. Suddenly I was no longer just trying to find a good deal on a home. I was planning my life. After countless home tours and a lot of searching online, I managed to select two great places within my budget, one in Irvine and another in Tustin, but each pulled me in different directions. The home in Tustin was older but had a lot of square footage for my budget. It had two bedrooms and a large living room, but it lacked air conditioning and one bathroom needed major updates. On the other hand, I couldn't stop thinking about a condo in Irvine. It was small, only one bedroom, but it had a beautiful kitchen, a laundry room upstairs, and it was close to Irvine Spectrum Center, my favorite place in the world. Between the purple living room walls and a cozy reading nook upstairs, the condo seemed perfect. I could see myself toasting to birthdays on the veranda and staying up late to binge watch Netflix in the living room with friends. But which was right? Would I be happier in the family starter home or the bachelorette pad? Even after hours of deliberation and making pro-con lists, I couldn't decide. Soon I started screening calls from my real estate agent. I had stress dreams of getting lost in strange houses, wandering around rooms I hated. I was anxious, exhausted, and still undecided. To add to it all, I knew there was a time limit. If I didn't make a choice soon, someone else might swoop in on my dream home. At one point, I considered forgetting about the whole thing and staying in my apartment forever, or at least another year or two. But owning a place was the dream, and now I knew it was actually possible. I'd come this far. I couldn't just forget about it now. Still not sure what to do, I moved forward with both places. I learned how to apply for a loan, thanks mom, and I found out that I needed a co-signer, thanks mom. I put in offers on both homes, ready to leave it up to the universe to decide where I would live. The owner of the two-bedroom house in Tustin countered with a fair price right away. Seeing the counter offer in my email, I realized I could have the place if I just said yes. And then I knew. That day, I sent back a polite note rescinding the offer. I didn't want to buy a house for a potential future version of me. I wanted a place I loved now. At the end of the summer, I moved into my one-bedroom condo in Irvine, and I couldn't be happier. I've already hosted a bunch of Netflix marathons and logged countless hours in my reading nook. I feel so at home, and I know that's exactly what I want. All right, get back to some jury charge. Ready? Here we go. Section 53A-54B6 of the Connecticut General Statutes provides that a person is guilty of a capital felony 
who is convicted of murder committed in the course of the commission of sexual assault in the first degree. For you to find the defendant guilty of this crime, the state must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, that the defendant was convicted of the murder of Jennifer Hawk Pettit. Two, that the defendant committed the crime of sexual assault in the first degree as to Jennifer Hawk Pettit. And three, that the murder occurred in the course of the commission of the sexual assault. The first element that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the defendant was convicted of the murder of Jennifer Hawk Pettit. Proof of this element will depend on your verdict as to the first count. If you find the defendant guilty as charged on the first count, this element of the 14th count will have been proven. If you do not find the defendant guilty as charged on the first count, this element of the 14th count will not have been proven. The second element that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the defendant committed the crime of sexual assault in the first degree as to Jennifer Hawk Pettit. Proof of this element will depend on your verdict as to the 13th count. If you find the defendant guilty as charged on the 13th count, this element of the 14th count will have been proven. If you do not find the defendant guilty as charged on the 13th count, this element of the 14th count will not have been proven. The third element that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the number occurred, the murder occurred in the course of the sexual assault. The phrase in the course of the sexual assault is a time limitation and means conduct occurring immediately before the commission, during the commission, or in the immediate flight after the commission of the sexual assault in the first degree. The immediate murder of a person to eliminate a witness to the crime or to avoid detection is also in the course of the sexual assault. The two witness rule, which I have discussed in my instruction on the fourth count, applies to the fourteenth count as well. I need not repeat that discussion. All right, we will stop there. That will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.